Hey everyone, I hope you're having a great conference. My name is Nathan Fabian, and welcome to Taming the Stack in PureScript. Let's face it, PureScript kind of has a call stack problem, and this is actually pretty common in functional languages. And what it comes down to is that PureScript lacks loops. Most languages have some sort of looping construct, but PureScript only uses functional recursion. In most runtimes, recursive calls, or really any function calls, take up additional stack space. And recursive calls aren't special in that regard, which means, consequently, if we loop too many times with recursion, then we'll get a stack overflow. A common way around this is something called tail call optimization. Tail call optimization is kind of a misnomer, I feel like, because is it really an optimization if it's necessary to actually write correct programs uh, in a functional language? But the, the gist of tail call optimization is that it turns first order self recursion in tail position to a JavaScript loop. I just say JavaScript because um, that's our most common backend. And uh, First order just means that we only call the function recursively in a, in a non-higher order context. So it's not passed to a function. It's not captured under a lambda that you know someone else might invoke dynamically or anything like that. Self-recursion means that we only call uh, a single function ourself recursively. And it happens as the last thing to evaluate in the function call, in evaluating the function. It's the last thing to do is call ourselves recursively. TCO is specifically a static transformation. It only looks at local information for a particular binding, a recursive binding. It doesn't involve any sort of uh, global uh, control flow analysis or anything complicated. It's really straightforward to implement. And just to bring it up, the general form of this is called tail call elimination. And other runtimes that are not JavaScript, are like Erlang or, uh, or Scheme, will support dynamic tail call elimination, which means that any dynamic call in tail position will be optimized to not take up additional stack space. Uh, and actually, like Safari supports this for JavaScript, but no other JavaScript runtimes do, unfortunately. So to get kind of an idea of what we're doing, I just want to look at a very, very basic, quick example. This is a common data type, list data type. This is exactly what is in the core libraries. And there's a function. Let, let's look at a function sum. And all this does is it pulls out integers and adds them together. And it has a one recursive call to itself, but it's not in tail position. It calls itself, but then uh, after that call is done, it has to take the result and add x to it. So this would not be optimized by uh, the compiler. However, we can do a simple transformation. Um, this has what's called a worker wrapper transformation, which has a worker go that is recursive, and it has a wrapper that invokes the worker. And in this worker, we take an additional argument, which is an accumulator, and then we kind of keep that state, and we only call ourselves in tail position. So whereas before we invoked the recursive function, then did something with the result, in this worker wrapper transformation, we take the result we go ahead and add it to our running accumulator, and then we uh, recurse after that. This gives us a tail position. And since this is also first order, this will get uh, compiled and optimized into a tight JavaScript loop. It doesn't have to eat additional stack space or allocate anything. So one thing that's actually interesting is that any first order non-tail position recursion can be mechanically transformed into tail recursion. So into this kind of form that we're looking for. Uh, as long as it's first order, it can be, any of that recursion can be, uh, can be rewritten into tail, tail recursion. And you might say, okay, if it's mechanical, can the compiler do that? And the answer is lots of compilers do. PureScript does not. But this is actually the steps I'm going to take you through are, uh, are, are transformations that many, many compilers do automatically for you. It's just it oftentimes has sort of a trade-off 
And so depending on the transformation that it has to do, it might require uh, doing a lot of additional allocation on the heat, which may make your algorithm a little bit slower. So if you need performance and you know you have bounded input that isn't particularly large, you can go for a recursive implementation that uh, is gonna be a lot faster. But if you have unbounded input, then it might be a good idea to go ahead and just eat the eat the uh, heap cost, the allocation cost. And so it might use more space and it might be a little bit slower for access because um, it has to do more dereferencing, but it, it will be stack safe. So our example here that we're gonna try to transform is a little bit more complicated. We're gonna look at a data type that's really similar to our list data type, and it's a binary tree. And this isn't really that much different. It's just, we have an additional recursive node. And so uh, what makes this relevant is that um, our, our recursion actually forks. We have to go in two different, go down two separate branches, recurse down two separate branches. And if this were a binary tree, this wouldn't be that big of a deal because it would be logarithmic, and, or if it were a balanced binary tree, rather, um, it, would be, uh, it would be logarithmic in depth. And so you wouldn't really have to worry about stack in that case, but we're gonna assume that this is non-balanced. And so we have no idea, this may be totally left associated or totally right associated. So we have to be kind of careful. So we're gonna look at an, impl an implementation of map for this data type, and it's, Pretty straightforward. This is actually what a compile a compi the compiler will derive this implementation for you. Unfortunately, this is not stack safe because we have two separate calls, recursive calls, and neither of them are in tail position. So what do we need to do to turn this into a tail recursive implementation that the compiler will optimize into a loop? First, let's look at where our recursion happens. Our next step will be to move all of our function arguments into bindings. And this is really not super necessary, but it is, uh, it makes it very clear um, what our kind of, what our evaluation order is and, and really tells us that this is obviously not in tail position because we have to call these functions, get the result and do something with it afterwards. So this is definitely not in tail position and it makes it a little clearer what's happening. Next, this is a little, this is a, a big jump, but it's not too complicated. I'm going to walk through it. We're going to convert what's convert this into what's called continuation passing style, which is um, just callbacks. It makes our evaluation order kind of uh, specific. So it's very similar to the worker wrapper transformation that we did before with our sum implementation. We have a wrapper here. We have a worker go here, and we have this extra argument, c o n t cont or continuation. And really all this is doing is taking those bindings that we pulled out. So if we look at this one, we have the binding on the left-hand side here, and then we have the call on the right-hand side. It just kind of flips that around the other way around. So now our call is on the right-hand side and our binding just kind of goes over to the, uh, to the or our call is on the left-hand side and our binding is on the right-hand side. And because it's a Lambda and we format it, you know, this will end up kind of looking like stair stepping, but it's really not stair stepping. It's just uh, another way to kind of like look at the flow of evaluation. And anytime then we looked at our old implementation where we're doing nothing but returning a value, we replace that with a call to our continuation cont. And so one way to actually look at this is that uh, this is the same sort of transformation as far as like an accumulator. Um, where this continuation is just an accumulator and we're literally accumulating progr a program. We're literally accumulating code to run. So we're traversing this, we're, we're doing this algorithm and our accumulator is just a new program to run. Really, really interesting, really elegant. Uh, our next step then is to lift these callbacks into explicit name bindings. You'll see this a lot in this kind of stuff. It's like put it in an explicit binding. This makes everything clear around uh, what's actually happening with this. What, what, what are all the variables involved? So you can see uh, we, we make our closures explicit. explicit. We have to uh, make sure we capture all of them and pass them to the continuations. This makes it very obvious what our dependencies are. Our next step then is to take these, clo these closures and turn that into a data type. So 
Here we have our identity continuation. This is what gets it started with. We have our left-hand side continuation goes down the left-hand side of the tree. We have our right-hand side continuation, which goes down the right-hand side of the tree. So we're just going to turn that into a sum type. We have each one, that it, all, the, all the values that they capture, they just get put into the data type. Again, we have our, our cont identity, which is kind of like a nil value that tells us it's done. So then what we're going to do is take all of those closure bindings and turn it into a single function, eval, that cases on this data type and executes the code that was in those, that, those closure bodies. So this is, if we go back here, we see cont LHS, we have this let binding, this go, cont RHS, and uh, that finishes it. And it's doing the same thing here. We have cont LHS, the let, and the new go call, and then cont RHS. Now, instead of invoking our continuation explicitly where it was a function, we are instead turning it into a call to eval. So we have eval and this is a typo. This is supposed. To, this is next here, but it should be cont. But you'll see up here eval cont. Uh, so instead of calling cont tip, we just call eval with the cont and our return value. So you'll notice here one thing that's interesting is that eval is always in tail position. Eval is in tail position here. Eval is in tail position here. Go is in tail position here and tail position here. So. Our calls are all in tail position. So we have a first order algorithm where everything is in tail position. The only problem now is that it's not self recursive. We have a mutually recursive set of bindings. So we're going to do a similar transformation that we did before with our continuations is that we're going to turn our mutually recursive go eval calls into a data type as well, kind of like how we turned our continuations into a data type. So we have our map go and the arguments. So we have the function that we're mapping, uh, the, the binary tree in our accumulator, and then we have our eval function with our return value and um, the accumulator. And we're going to turn these into a case. So instead of having our separate bindings, again, we move this into data types and a case. And so if we look at this now, all of our calls to go are now in tail position. We only have a single self-recursive loop. And so this will turn into a nice uh, stack safe implementation of this algorithm. And this is all very mechanical. You can apply these transformations to essentially any, any recursive algorithm that satisfies the, that criteria of being, uh, of being first order. So if that's all you want out of this talk, that's fine. You can, you can leave it at that. That's all you need to know to write stack safe. Uh, the basic pure script algorithms, but let's keep. Go I, I'd like to keep going. I, there's a few things I kind of want to explore with this, which is, which are I think are pretty interesting. One is just that instead of using tail recursion uh, like references to Go, you can you can, like our our worker, you can use tail rec the tail rec function, and this is in the the standard library and kind of the same idea before. We're, we're instead we're calling tail rec. And tail rec makes our kind of our, our worker here correct by construction. So we can't use go accidentally wrong. And so it'll always be stack safe because we have to return an explicit data type at the end of each iteration. So this makes it a little bit easier to, to keep things straightforward. So th that's just, you don't have to do this. I, I, I almost never use tail rec, but it is nice to get that sort of guarantee. It might be a little bit slower, it's just, just the issue. But I'm gonna look at something here called a greatest fixed point. And if we take our, our worker and just put that in its own function, uh, and own, like we treat it like a state machine, it's taking an input in like a state and then transitioning it to a new state. So we've got a map call. And it's just every time you invoke the transition function, it transitions it to the next state in map call. Um, all we've essentially done is removed these these like loop and done. We've just taken the worker and removed like the extra wrappers. And we'll see here; those are just miss missing. We just map each state to a new state. We can then take uh, essentially take that loop that we had before or the the, the wrapper and define this eval function, which will evaluate a map call 
and turn it into B. So we can call our stepper, and then we just case on our identity, our identity uh, continuation here. If, if we know that there's nothing left to evaluate in the continuation, then we can just go ahead and return the result. And I think our, this was actually a mistake. These arguments should be flipped. But it's the same idea. And if it's not our identity uh, accumulator, then we just continue stepping. So this will this is this corresponds to what's called small step semantics in programming languages. And this is great because um, we have a very clear evaluation state that we can start and stop whenever we want. This is great for actually writing things like debuggers. If we we've essentially defined our own little language just for this map call. And if we wanted to, we could use our stepper function here and step through every single evaluation step of this function. It'd be great for if you if you wrote a little language, you could use this approach to make essentially make your own little debugger for it. So it's super useful. Now I want to look at, but you know, we had to match on our map eval con identity specifically. That's the only thing here. So I want to look at what this step data type is, this done and loop. Step here is it's step A, B. We've got loop A or done B. And this is essentially just, this is just either with uh, more specific names to make it clear what's happening. Originally, Tailrec actually used just either, but it was very easy to get them mixed up. Like, which one is it? Is it left or right? And so it, it was changed to use explicit names, which makes it a lot easier to use. But it, 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 in essence, it's really just either. So we're going we're gonna to transform it to either. We're going to not use loop and or the step data type. We're going to use either. And we're actually going to kind of like flip the meanings around here. So done means left, which kind of makes sense. You know, I, if, you, if you think of like either as sort of an error condition or like a way to like halt or, or like short circuit the computation, then like left is kind of like that's done. Like we're done with it now. Like there's nothing left to, there's nothing left to compute. And so right becomes our loop constructor. We're just flipping the meaning. And then we're going to take, um, we're going to use the pure script fixed points library or fixed points uh, or func their uh, fixed point functors. So specifically, our, the greatest fixed point is the new data type. And we're going to use our either functor, so either b. So it returns a b. And we can write this fix function that operates just like tail rec, and it will evaluate any fixed point over either B and return a B here. And so it's the same idea, left return, it'll just return that, right, keep going. So it's essentially what we were doing in our eval function. And you can then turn that into, we can take our step function and we can compose it with a, uh, a condition here, a termination condition, essentially. That's kind of what the uh, left, the loop or done, is just a way to communicate that we need to terminate. And so we can compose it with a side termination condition and get the same result down here of, of map call a map call a b to b to evaluate it. So now we've looked at kind of what uh, the greatest fixed point is. Let's look at if we try to swap this out with a least fixed point. The greatest fixed point is this this new either b, and that corresponds to an existentially qualified a and a tuple that has our step function and the state. So the existentially quantif the existential existential excuse me quantification over a just means that we can't see it from the outside. So if you look at the all the types, this a never shows up in any signatures. So it's it's totally abstract. We have some abstract state, and we have some uh, some stepper function that takes that state and gives us an, our result back or a new state and to, to keep looping. So in order to evaluate it, we have to, we have to keep looping until we find uh, our, our, left, our left constructor, which will tell us to terminate. So we're just kind of pull out that either, we're left with new f, and so we got a to f of a paired with an a value, an abstract a value. So one thing that's actually really interesting about existential, existential quantification and why a lot of functional languages don't really support them, and that's because existentials can be eliminated through what's called a closure isomorphism. That, and that just means essentially that any, any uh, existential it can, uh, has an encoding to a closure. It's kind of where you get 
uh, you know, object, you know, objects correspond to existential. So it's like where objects are a poor man's closures or closures are a poor man's objects, you know, in functional languages, we, uh, it, you don't often have to have existentials. You can encode them through closures. So we're going to look at kind of what that means, though, like what this isomorphism means. And so we're going to look at a simpler example, not our, our, uh, our fixed point, our new type. We're going to look at this can show, which is kind of common. You know, I, I, I want to like somehow represent, you know, a data type an apps, like an abstract data type that supports a show function, you know, that can turn it into a string. So we're going to look at type can show if it was existentially quantified, it would be exists a and it would be a function a to string and, and that object. And this existential can be encoded as a closure with a uh, a rank to universally quantified eliminator, which is just a really complicated way of saying we're going to CPS, we're going to continue turn this this data type into a continuation passing style. But to, in order to preserve the abstractness of A, we have to make sure the continuation that consumes these values here is must be polymorphic in the A value. So this rank to uh, universal quantification just means that the what, whatever implementation it goes in here it must treat that abstractly and really what that means this is kind of our example of here what that means is that if our uh, consumer here this callback if all if we have some abstract a and all we can do with it we can't do anything with it. We can't, we can't like add it to something because all we have is this function that's paired with it that turns it into a string. So having that A and a function that turns it into a string means that it's equivalent to just having a string and, and really uh, because of laziness and, and all that, um, it's, it's really equivalent to having a deferred string or kind of like a lazy string. And that's kind of why in Haskell you'll see like, uh, you know, existential, existential quantification is kind of an anti-pattern. And it's not so much that it's an anti-pattern, it's just that uh, Haskell's really good at universal quantification and uh, you can just encode it with universal quantification and it'll probably be a lot, lot easier to use. So we're gonna try to apply this transformation to our new type. We've got tuple A to F of A and an A. So before we had our existential A, we could essentially just turn it into a unit type, right? Because we can't do anything except just apply this step function to it. But the problem when we do that with this type uh, is, uh, whereas before with this, if we look at this implementation, the A in the function only, uh, only appears as an argument. In this function, it also appears as a uh, in, in the return type. So it occurs in both positive and negative position of this type, which makes it, I don't, I don't know what to write here. I can't, I, you, act, you literally can't write this. And that's because you have to use a uh, type level quantification for recursion, or what's usually called mu. And in, there is a data type, we'll, and we'll get to that, but, uh, pure script and Haskell actually apply this to any data declaration, data or new type, not not uh, not type, not type aliases or type synonyms. Any data or new type actually gets this implicitly applied, and that's what lets you write recursive data types. So this, it, in order to write this mu quantification, you, that's where we get this data type mu f, and it, this is what creates that recursion. We've created a new, uh, like a recursive data type here that we can apply our f to. So we can actually factor out that unit arrow, that's the function unit functor. And so we can get a, a kind of a simpler mu data type, which was what exists in pure script fixed points. And then we can um, get our sort of delayed mu, uh, which we'll need for like evaluation order purposes. Um, we don't want to be too strict. And so we'll just compose that f with the function unit functor. So our delayed mu is compose function unit with f. So now let's look at, can we write a fixed function for this? And it's actually pretty easy. Um, we're going to use delayed mu and the same either b functor. And you'll see here we, uh, we unroll, uh, we, we're importing data.functor.mu and data.functor.compose. And unroll just takes that mu wrapper off. Um, and so we're left with a compose. So we have to kind of and take that wrapper off. And so then we have our thunk. 
then we can call our thunk, get our left or our, our right value, and we get, um, and it's the same sort of thing, left just returns the result, or we just recurse on mu. So we've written our fixed type, and it's actually really simple just to swap this out, you know? So this, there's a few things here. One is just I've replaced loop and done with right and left. Um, otherwise, it's the exact same worker. Like the logic here is exactly the same as the worker we had written before. Our wrapper is just a little bit different. We've got our new fix function here. And the worker just has to have this extra like roll and compose and that's to make kind of like the, the types work out. And then we have our, def our, our delayed computation here. And this implementation is just as stack safe as the other one. This will run in a uh, constant stack. We've just bundled everything up into these, this, this thunk, okay, this, this function unit. So can we kind of undo this transformation? So we did all of these steps to get like, oh, these data, define these data types, turn it into like a, a tail recursive function. But you see this function now isn't even like really, I mean, it's recursive, but it's not tail recursive because we're returning right, but uh, it's just as stack safe because of the way we're computing, we're using fix here and delayed computations. The, de the delayedness is crucial. If you remove that function unit, this will not work. And of course, it will just continue to spin and explode on the stack. So the, de the delay is, is absolutely crucial. But we can kind of start to undo these transformations. So we're going back now to our mutually recursive Go and eval. And the same thing, this is, this is just as stack safe as the other one. This will run in, in a constant stack. Can we go further? We can keep going, then again, we can turn it into just remove our continuation data types and just use named continuations here. And again, this is still stack safe. We can go even further, turn it back into our original continue or into our continuation passing style here. And again, this is still stack safe. Instead of just identity though, we have to turn we have to use this done or this is it ends up being what our identity is is role, composed, const, left. Kind of, kind of extreme, um, but this is still stack safe, and this is, uh, in some ways, this is a lot nicer to read and use. Can we go even further? You know, we had that that kind of direct style where it was just bindings, um, and we can. But first, I want to look at what this data type is that we're working with. So, if we take this this type alias, make it a rec, we're going to call it rec rather, and it's mu compose function unit either b is this very 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 big kind of like uh, fancy looking type let's kind of like inline that and kind of get rid of all of uh, get rid of all the functorness for now the functoriness and just turn it into a pretty straightforward recursive definition we've got rec b is equal to rec we've got unit to either b or rec b again so this is where we get that that's why we have mu here we, we have this recursive data type that that recurses here and I'm going to do kind of a kind of an interesting transformation here. I'm going to take this unit arrow and I'm going to distribute it to the branches of either. So instead of unit to either be, we have an either where the unit is under each constructor. This isn't necessarily a safe transformation in general, but for this particular type, this is equally as expressive. So it's totally OK. Um, we don't lose anything with this. Um, so we're so we've got this unit to be and unit to rec be. We're just going to rename those back to like our nice done and loop. Uh, so we've got done unit b and loop unit to rec b. And uh, this this unit to be is kind of unnecessary, like the unit here, because we can turn that into just done b and loop unit to rec b. Because if we want like a delayed done value, then kind of just most of the time we can just wrap it in a rec. So it's not super necessary for our purposes. It might be necessary if you were doing additional composition with like the unit to be like after you're actually done with it. Um, and this just preserves like laziness value. This is why in like Haskell, like you don't ever have to think about these units, <laughs> these units like this, because everything just kind of implicitly has that in, in, in a lazy value. But we're, we're, we're keeping this and this is actually super, this type is really interesting here. So if we just go ahead and turn this into our functory name again here, function unit rec b, and kind of abstract this away into an f, we've got this rec fb, done b, loop f, rec fb, wow. 
And so we, we can recover our rec here with rec function unit. And this type here, rec, is actually the naive definition of the free monad. So it wouldn't be an eight Fabian top without something about something about free monads. So through this process, we've we've essentially just we've derived a. Well, it's naive because uh, it, it's the it's the true essence of it's the minimal definition of free. Um, the, there, there are some there are some properties of it that aren't great, but for our for this, it's totally fine uh, for for uh, for pedagogic purposes. <laughs> it's totally fine. Um, and then our rec type alias is what we call trampoline, so free function unit. So instead of going through the process of like writing the implementation for these, um, which could be an entire talk in itself, we're going to just import data.free. So we have to um, use, we have to define this suspend function. It doesn't exist totally, it has a delay function, but we need this just to like delay evaluations. Again, the delaying the evaluations is kind of subtle. When you're dealing with this, so it's so we're going to use this definition. It's also equivalent to bind with a pure unit. Um, you don't, you even don't necessarily need with with uh, data dot free in this particular implementation. You don't need the function unit functor. You can you can kind of get around it. Um, but for for our purposes, we'll keep this here. We'll define this suspend function, and then we can write just using typical monad stuff with the trampoline monad. We can we can recover our nice direct style binding. So go fl binds to l, etc. We're just using pure at the end. So this is very nice, very minimal, very close to our original our original algorithm. It just has a little extra stuff. It still has kind of the wrapper of run trampoline, but it's pretty close. And then just adding a little bit of syntactic noise. Uh, but clearly we're in a DSL here. Our stack safe DSL. And we're back to something that is very, very close to our original, our original definition. And this is totally stack safe as well. So you may ask, why did we go through all that process of like data types and all this kind of stuff when you can just kind of like throw in these, these function calls and all that? And there are actually like a lot of good reasons. Again, I, I brought up some issues around like this is kind of like defining your own little language and small step semantics. You could use this for debugging and stepping through code. And but for more practical considerations, it's that when you have a tail recursive loop that's specialized to your your subset, your language subset, um, it's just it's gonna it's gonna jit like a whole lot better on the JavaScript backend. The uh, the trampoline monad is actually lets you deal with the higher order recursive case and so like any call any recursion anywhere then that just that binds through trampoline becomes stack safe which is very nice but we don't really need this we, we still have a first order recursive algorithm we don't really need that and so if we go to just like the tail recursive loop with explicit data types that'll that'll the just-in-time compiler in javascript will hit that really hard and it'll be a lot faster than the trampoline approach the trampoline approach has a kind of like a performance hit of anywhere from 25 to 50 times, you know, slower than the uh, than a naive recursive algorithm. The uh, in my experience, this is just in my experience of like writing these functions. And but it in my experience, the other one, the using the tail recursive loop with explicit data constructors is about I don't know six to eight times slower than our naive algorithm so um big performance different difference and so th that's really kind of where where it stands like trampoline is obviously like great and if you just want to like stack safety really really quickly without doing hardly any work um you can use trampoline just like this it'll give you something stack safe it'll just be really slow um and i haven't benchmarked it but i think it's you know promising to kind of go the middle of the road with for this first order case where you can do sort of like our least fixed point approach are the original one where you're just using closures and a fixed loop. So um, thank you. That is that is stack safety in PureScript. There's there's a lot more to like talk about um, around stack safety. There's like other stack safe monads like app and stuff, but um, that's just basically it. They, they essentially just use a free monad sort of encoding and that's what that's what gives them stack safety. So that's kind of that's kind of like the end of that story. So, all right, thanks everyone. One, uh, since Nathan's not here, Anvum's going to be taking the questions. Yes, I'll be. I'll try to take the questions. 
<laughs> that was a, a pretty great uh, talk full of a lot of stuff. So uh, I, I'll try to answer the questions as best as I can. <laughs> uh, so what does first order versus higher, higher order recursion means? Um, I think um, what this, what Nate meant by that was that uh, instead of a function calling another function recursively, so first order would be uh, a function calling uh, another function recursively, right? And higher order recursion would involve uh, passing a function that happens to be recursive uh, into another function, and then that function uh, calling the past in value, right? So it doesn't have static information on what function it's calling. Um, and that's the distinction. So that makes it a lot harder to optimize it and make it stack safe. 